Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. tonight to bless his holy name for this is the day that the Lord has made and we have come to rejoice and be glad in it and so we honor the Lord tonight as we bring greetings we greet you in Jesus joy and in hallelujah praise we thank God for our bishop the right reverend James Levert Davis the presiding bishop of the second Episcopal district and to our Episcopal Supervisor, we thank God for Mother Rillis Beavers Davis. We give honor to uh, my colleague, uh, the Reverend Dr. Ronald Braxton, the pres presiding elder of the Potomac District, and his queenly wife, Sister Marie Braxton. We thank God for all of the pastors and their spouses, to the brothers and sisters of the clergy, to Sister D. Faye Connolly, the president of the Second Episcopal District Women's Missionary Society, and to Sister Jeanette Height, the president of the Washington Conference Missionary Society. And then yes, to Brother Matthew Douglas, the president of the Second Episcopal District Lay Organization, and Sister Glenn White, the president of our Washington Conference Lay. And we thank God today for Sister Chrissy Williams, the director of the conference YPD, as well as Brother Stefan Street, the president. To our brothers and sisters all, to Lottie Dottie and to everybody, we welcome you to the 2020 Capital District Virtual Conference. And yes, we're virtual because of COVID-19 and all of the matters appertaining and social distancing we're coming by way of the cyberspace to let you know that we're here and we're so glad you came to be with us. And so as we gather this year, we thank the Lord for this glorious crusade, this opportunity to come and to be the real church that rises to the challenge. That's our theme this year, being the real church rising to the challenge. It's, it's the theme that our bishop established being the church that rises to the challenge, the, the, the challenges that we face in this current environment, the challenges of dealing with the loss of jobs and the lack of in-person worship, the challenges that we face having to deal with so much death and sickness, the challenge of losing jobs and income while waiting for the government to send that check that never seems to arrive. The challenge of having to teach our children at home, oh my God, as our children learn through a computer without being in a physical classroom. The, the challenges of social distancing and not being able to feel each other's touch and to be able to sit in the sanctuary together. And oh yes, the challenges of a national administration was doing its best to diminish our rights and to suppress our vote while stoking up racial division throughout our country promoting white supremacy. Oh God, have mercy. We as the fellowship of believers who are the children of the most high God, we have no choice but to rise to the challenge. We know our God is still on the throne. 
We know that he's still making a way out of no way, that he's still sitting high but looking low. And so we come, in spite of all the challenges, to restore hope, to empower the people, to advance the kingdom of God, and yes, to leave a kingdom legacy, the real church. And so at this closing worship service, we come to glorify our God beyond all measure. We come to bless his holy name. We come simply to please God and to magnify his glorious name. And beloved, we pray that your hope will be restored during this service and that you will be so empowered that you will be convicted and inspired by the power of the Holy Ghost to advance the kingdom of God. And we, we pray that you will also be inspired with purpose and vigor to leave a kingdom legacy to those who will come behind us, to those who will hold up the bloodstained banner. And so we thank God as we shout hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. And so as we thank God for our Episcopal leader, for his visionary leadership, he comes now to bring a word of greetings. Let the people of God say amen. To the Reverend Johnny Calhoun and the Reverend Patricia Calhoun, the first family of the Capital District of the Washington Conference, to the Capital District and all of its constituents, particularly its pastors and laity at large. Congratulations on this, the observation, celebration, and work of your district conference. God expects us to be of use to him in kingdom. We cannot get the best out of people unless we expect the best from people. And so we congratulate you, all of you, for expecting the best from all of us as we seek to give our best to them. Congratulations, and may you have a wonderful conference. Well, we welcome you to our closing worship service of the Capital District Conference. We praise God for all that we have experienced on this day. We thank and praise God. Can you just put your hands together in this virtual space? Hallelujah. In your homes, in your cars, wherever you are, you ought to give God praise for his mighty power, for his awesomeness. Hallelujah to Jesus. We thank God and we praise God for the dynamic leadership of our presiding elder, the Reverend John. Calhoun and First Lady Pat Reverend Patricia Calhoun. Come on, church, give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are excited about what this moment brings. We're at the close now. We've gone through Bible studies. We've gone through workshops. We've gone through panel discussions. And now we come to the moment of the closing word that we will hear from the Lord. Can you give God praise right where you are? Because God has been faithful. He's been faithful to us. And we just honor him today. The day and we welcome his presence into this virtual space and so we thank you for joining us and we pray now that God would fill this space fill your homes and fill your cars wherever you are that the outpouring of his spirit would overtake you in the name of Jesus let us continue to worship as hallelujah. hallelujah God is good and he's worthy to be praised God cares. God cares for you. And when you're in doubt and you can't find your 
humbly bow before you to recognize that you are our God and beside you there is none other. We know it's only in you that we live and move and have our very being. But we know if it had not been for you on our side, we don't know where in the world we'd be. So God, we enter your gates with thanksgiving and we enter your courts with praise and proclaim we are grateful and thankful to you and we've gathered to bless your holy name. God, a few of your people have gathered to say thank you. Thank you for keeping us in the midst of unprecedented health, social, economic, and political challenges. God, we say thank you. Thank you for comforting us 
in the midst of unimaginable loss and grief. God, we say thank you. Thank you for healing us physically and giving us spaces of mental and emotional outlet and rest. God, thank you for church leadership, lay and clergy who have risen to address the unusual challenges of this historic time in our lives. God, thank you for showing yourself strong in these changing and challenging times as you continue to prove to us that you are our God and you change not. So God, as we come to the close of our virtual Capital District Conference, God, we are grateful for the blessing of anointed visionary leadership. Thank you for our servant leaders in Bishop and Mother Davis. Continue to bless them, keep them, and use them. God, we thank you for the blessing of presiding elder Johnny Calhoun and Reverend Patricia Calhoun. Continue to bless them, keep them, and use them for your glory and your honor. God, thank you for this conference, for what our eyes have seen and for what our ears have heard and for what our hearts have felt through the anointed teaching and sharing and preaching of God's word. Now, God, we invite your holy presence as we gather to hear your word. God, we know the preachers have prepared but we ask that you bless them the more, even in this hour. Send forth power and anointing as your word goes forth. God, we pray it accomplishes what you set it to accomplish. And we ask, Lord God, that you prepare our hearts to receive your word with joy, to receive your word with thanksgiving. Please transform us by the power of your word so that when we come down off the mountain of this conference, we will be inspired and stirred to continue to be the real church, restoring hope, empowering the people, advancing the kingdom, ready to leave a legacy. So come on in, Holy Spirit. Come on in, Heavenly Dove, with all your quickening powers. Kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. In the matchless and powerful name of Jesus, our risen King, let the church say amen, amen, and amen. reading Romans 8 24 through 31 for we are saved by hope but hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth why does he yet hope for but if we hope for that we have not seen then do we with patience wait for it likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we shall pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for those of them that love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did not 
foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestine, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. It may not seem like it right now, but he's still faithful. It may not
Praise the Lord, everybody. It's preaching time. And oh, we're thankful tonight. The Lord has blessed us with a tremendous lineup of anointed pastors who've come to preach the word of God. As we have gone through the, the conference, you've noticed prayerfully that we have continued to uh, affirm and to emphasize the theme, restoring the hope and empowering people, advancing the kingdom of God and leaving a kingdom legacy. And so they come tonight preaching from those themes. We thank God tonight for the Reverend Dr. Gerald Folsom, the pastor of Hemingway Memorial. He'll be preaching about hope. Reverend Dr. Derek Brown, the pastor of New Hope, AME Church will come. He'll be preaching about empowering people. And then the Reverend Dr. Darrell Kearney will come. He'll preach about advancing the kingdom of God. And last but not least, the Reverend Dr. Michael Bell, the pastor of Allen Chapel AME Church in Washington, D.C., he'll come to preach about leaving a kingdom legacy. And I could introduce and give you an overview of who these great pastors are, but there's a video that can say it much better than me. Let the people of God say amen. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Capital District of the Washington Conference, is honored to present four powerful preachers for tonight's closing worship experience. Beginning with Reverend Dr. Derek N. Brown, Senior Pastor of New Hope AME Church in Waldorf, Maryland, who will come from the theme, Restoring the Hope. Reverend Brown accepted his call to preach in 1999 and was ultimately ordained itinerant elder by the AME Church in 2006. The church also awarded him an academic scholarship in 2003 to recognize his academic excellence. He earned a Master of Divinity from Howard University and a doctorate from Payne Theological Seminary. Reverend Brown bases his ministry on the E3 principle of empowering, encouraging, and enabling individuals to live life to its fullest potential. Reverend Dr. Gerald Folsom is preaching from the theme, Empowering the People. And that is exactly what he is doing as senior pastor of Hemingway Memorial AME Church in District Heights, Maryland. Proud of his long distinguished government career, he has also served Community of Hope AME Church on the ministerial staff, the social justice and public service ministries, and as their men's ministry leader. Pastor Folsom was ordained itinerant elder in 2014 appointed Wayman Memorial AME pastor in 2016, St. Stephen's AME in 2018, and then pastor of Hemingway Memorial in 2019. Advancing the Kingdom is next with Reverend Dr. D.K. Kearney, the beloved pastor of Turner Memorial AME Church in Hyattsville, Maryland. A powerful preacher and leader, he empowers people to reach their fullest potential. And as founder and president of Empower Ministry Group, Dr. Kearney ministers through relevant, timely, and spirit-filled messages, devotionals, postings, and encouraging moments of meditation. His 30 years of ministerial experience starting at the age of 16 has prepared Reverend Kearney for innovative, cutting-edge ministry and leadership in Hyattsville including a Master of Divinity and a doctorate with a focus in liberation theology from Payne Theological Seminary. Our fourth and final message tonight, Leaving a Legacy, will be delivered by Reverend Dr. Michael E. Bell, Sr., Washington, D.C.'s Allen Chapel AME Church Senior Pastor. With his Master of Divinity from Howard University and Southern Methodist University Doctor of Ministry, Pastor Bell has absolutely left and continues to leave legacies wherever he serves. A third generation preacher, he has led several congregations before being assigned pastor of Allen Chapel AME in 2005. And as illustrated by the multitude of community programs and ministries like the Allen Chapel Outreach Center and Food Pantry, they continue to serve the spiritual and physical needs of the residents of Ward 8 and the surrounding community, all under the anointing and visionary vision of victory leadership of Reverend Dr. Michael E. Bell Sr. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Reverend Dr. Derek N. Brown, Reverend Dr. Gerald Folsom, Reverend Dr. D.K. Kearney, and Reverend Dr. Michael E. Bell Sr. Be blessed.
Is Jeremiah 29 11. Jeremiah 29 11. And the word of God reads as follows For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope 
and a future. My brothers and sisters, pray with me as we preach from the subject, the audacity of hope. The audacity of hope. Let us bow. Eternal and all wise God, again, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this time that we have come together, God. God, we ask that you have your way, God. Do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. But God, we want you to get the honor and the glory. God, it is our prayer that everybody under the sound of my voice, God, God will be blessed beyond measure. I pray, God, that you will decrease me and increase in me, that people will be blessed and encouraged to run on and see what the end will be. We thank you, God, for this moment, and we just turn it all over to you. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Let everybody say amen, amen, and amen. The audacity of hope. My brothers and sisters, in October 17th, 2006, an author and former president of the United States, Barack Obama, published a book entitled The Audacity of Hope. And although the book outlined his political and spiritual beliefs, uh, there was an underlying emphasis and focus on daring to dream beyond current circumstances. Within that book, uh, the focus of the audacity of hope, uh, the emphasis was on the fact that you had to go beyond where you currently are, that you had to allow your mind to take you to a place that was greater than where you currently were. Uh, Barack Obama spoke about how he came up with the title of the book. The title of the book came about from him uh, hearing Jeremiah Wright preaching a sermon. And the sermon was based off of a painting. And the painting was a painting of a young woman who uh, was attached to a harp. And she was, she was playing, playing the harp. And the harp only had one string. Not only did it only have one string, but she was battered and bruised and beaten and worn out, but she still uh, took that one string and gave it her all. She had the audacity to praise God with the little that she had. And I believe that we can learn a lot from that on today. I believe that that we can take whatever we have and still give our best. I know that 2020 has been a challenging year for many folk. There have been some ups and there have been some downs. There have been some good times and there have been some bad times. There have been joy and there's been pain, laughter and tears, some rough places and some smooth places. There have been some things that have happened to us over this past year that should have had us in a padded cell, should have had us go crazy and out of my, our minds. In fact, when you look at all of the things that have occurred this year, uh, we, 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 we were uh, under the leadership or lack thereof uh, 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 of someone who put politics uh, before people. We had uh, the U.S. now surpassed many other countries with 10 million people infected with the coronavirus and then more than 238,000 deaths. And so it is a wonder why folk uh, have lost hope and wanted to give up and wanted to throw in the towel. Uh, but I believe that God is saying, no, not now. Uh, I, I believe that God is saying you can't throw in the towel, that you, you can't give up because I've made a promise to you. And that promise that I made to you was to give you a future and a hope. Let me tell you this. What I have found is that when the enemy comes after you, Number one, he doesn't mess with nobody that ain't got no destiny or purpose tied to their lives. The enemy is going to try to come after you when you are a threat to him. And so he's going to pull out all of the stops to try to stop you dead in your track. Well, what does he do to stop you the first?
first thing he tries to do is to mess with your mind because if I can get in your mind and try to take your dreams away and steal your hope what does the Bible says about faith faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen so if I can take your hope then I got your faith because without hope look hope is about having vision beyond where you are but if I can get to your hope then I can get to your future but I'm so glad today that God slapped the enemy's hand and said you can't touch this one this one is a child of mine so in spite of what it looked like in spite of what it seemed like I still am in control I want to hit you with just a few things and I'm gonna go on and get out of here when we talk about renewing hope, it all sounds good, but preacher, I need some help today. How can you find hope when you feel hopeless? I want to hit you with a few things. Number one, you got to put your faith in God and not in people and things. Too many of us have wasted too many times putting our hope into some stuff that can't help us. People are fickle. People will fail you, but God is there at all times. Put your faith in the one that woke you up this morning and started you on your way. You got to put your faith in the one, good God Almighty, that, alive, that lifted up dead bodies. God help me, Holy Ghost. Don't you understand that when you put your faith in God and not in people or things, you can't go wrong. Point number two, how in the world can you have hope when you feel hopeless? Let me tell you this. You got to understand that God is not worth worried about your stuff uh, too many of us spend too many times worrying about what the devil is doing to us instead of focusing on what God can do in our lives don't you understand that you already got the victory and that God is just waiting for you to catch up with him that your promise is already down there waiting for you all you got to do is just put your trust in him and know that if God said it it shall come to pass uh, God already knows your wants and your needs and he ain't intimidated by your requests and the devil can't stop what God has for you I'm so glad today that there were some folk that gave up on you gave up on me gave up on your dreams but I'm so glad today that we serve a God who stared the devil in the face and said you ain't gonna kill what I want alive aren't you glad today if there's anybody wherever you are if you're standing at home if you're in your kitchen in your bedroom if you know that God is still in control throw your head back and say yeah ah point number three God gives us strength ah don't you understand that the Bible says but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Preacher, that sounds good. But what does that mean to me? Don't you understand what I love about the illustration of an eagle? Is that eagles are unlike any other bird. Eagles soar. God help me, Holy Ghost. Eagles soar beyond the storm. Other birds have to take shelter because when the storm comes, it comes to wipe them out. But baby, we like eagles. We store, soar beyond the storm. And so the storm will be going on all around us. But we are above it looking down, saying, my God, my God is a protector. He's a healer. He's a provider. He's a way maker. He's a heart fixer. And he's a mind regulator. Come on and hold on to God's unchanging hand and know that God is still in control. Point, 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 point number four. God is at work. I know oftentimes in our situations it seems like that God is not there. It seems like we find ourselves saying, God, where are you in the midst of our storm? Where are you in the midst of our pain? Where are you in the midst of our heartache? But God told me to tell you today that God is at work. Even when it seems like he's not there. What I love about God is that he's a God who sometimes works behind the scenes. 
And even when you think that it's not being done, God is working it out for you. Oh, preacher, that sounds good. But I need you to give me one more thing. Well, uh, before I take my seat, I want to share one last reflection with you. Don't you understand? And point number five, you don't have, you have to make sure that you don't lose focus or, and or insight on who God is. God help us, Holy Ghost. You can't lose focus or insight on who God is. So much of our attention is focused on what God has done. But when you pause and think a moment and take a moment to reflect on who God is, you can't help but want to go crazy. Don't you understand? My God, I asked the question, my God, how can you have renewed strength? Well, you got to have the audacity to hope for something better. What does audacity? It means it means that no by, by no means by any means necessary you're gonna take the bold step of being able to move forward is there anybody up in here that's watching don't mind saying my god in spite of where i am i'm gonna press on anyway in spite of how i feel i'm still gonna give him glory in spite of wanting to give up i'm still gonna give him praise i'm here today to tell you you know in the and let me tell you how do you hold on to the promises that God has for you well you hold on to the promises by holding on to the promise giver y'all just, just missed that you gotta hold on to the promise giver because if God said it it shall come to pass ah, he made a promise to us and he is the one that's gonna keep out his promise to us oh so you might as well tell everybody the folk that gave up on you the folk that wanted you to go crazy the folk that wanted you to turn throw in the towel tell them don't pop the cork just yet don't throw a party don't sit there and celebrate because I'm still here how do I keep hope how do I renew my hope I put my trust in God oh Jesse Jackson said keep hope alive but I believe it was Edward Moat that pinned it best when he said my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ come on somebody on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand I know you want to give up I know you want to throw in the towel but keep your hope in God the devil can't kill what God wants alive have the audacity walk with boldness speak the word every now and then you gotta stare the devil in the face and speak back to him and tell him no weapon formed against me shall prosper and stop worrying about Negroes talking about you because every tongue that rises up against you in judgment shall be condemned and if that ain't enough for you how do I keep hope alive how do I renew my hope oh all I can think about is the fact that my God the one I serve got a dead body out of the grave after three days I bet the body was smelly I bet it was stench all around but I thank God that if he got up Jesus out of the grave then my God he can handle cancer he can handle other stuff that's how you keep your hope because you realize that your hope is in the one that woke you up this morning and started you on your way say yay 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 renewing your hope you renew your hope ah, by remembering the promises God gave to you he said in Jeremiah for I know the plans I have for you there are plans to give you a future and a hope. There's a plan to prosper you. 
And so don't you let yourself get caught up in looking at your circumstances. You have renewed hope because your hope is in the one who woke you up this morning and started you on your way. If Jesus, because he got up, so can you. So I dare you on today to have the audacity to hope. God bless you. Good evening, Capital District Conference. Protocol has already been established. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter, the 12th through the 16th verse. The Gospel of Matthew, 21st chapter, 12th through the 16th verse. I have the Message Bible, but if you listen, I'll read. And the Bible says this, Jesus went straight to the temple and threw out everyone who had set up shop, buying and selling. He kicked over the tables of loan sharks and the stalls of dove merchants. He quoted this text, my house was designated a house of prayer. You have made it a hangout for thieves. Now there was room for the blind and crippled to get in. They came to Jesus and he healed them. When the religious leaders saw the outrageous things he was doing and heard all the children running and shouting through the temple, Hosanna to David's son, they were up in arms and took him to task. Do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus said, yes, I hear them. Jesus said, yes, I hear them. And haven't you read in God's word from the mouths of children and babies, I'll furnish a place of praise. If you stick with me just for a few moments, I would like to take the sermon title, Empowering the People to Be Game Changers. Empowering to people to be game changers. Pray with me as we get started. God, in the name of Jesus, move Gerald out of the way. Let the real preacher preach. Let the Holy Ghost do it. God, open up hearts, open up minds. Do what you need to do. But whatever you're going to do, do it right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Empowering the people to be game changers. My favorite preacher, my favorite preacher was the late Reverend William Macmillan. That name is probably not a known name. He was my pastor when I was growing up at Bethel AME Church, the church under the bridge in small town Quitman, Q-U-I-T-M-A-N, Georgia. Quitman had two traffic lights, no fast food places, one hospital when I was growing up. Reverend Macmillan, Reverend Macmillan did not have a seminary degree. Sometimes his subject and verb did not always agree. He was always a little nervous when it came to formal AME conferences and meetings. But what I liked about him is when you needed prayer in the midnight hour, he was available. When you were at the hospital, sick in your body, he came to visit. When your money was low, he pulled you to the side and helped you out. But most of all, when you approached him as a child and he was standing with the adults, he would be standing with the stewards and standing with the trustees and standing with the missionaries, he would immediately leave the adults, come and bend down on one knee and spend time with the children. To the young people, when I was growing up, Reverend Macmillan was like that quarterback who threw the game-winning touchdown pass. He was like that baseball player who hit a home run in the bottom of the ninth inning. He was our LeBron James who hit the winning shot. He left the church leaders, met us at our point of need, and encouraged us to be somebody. He was a game changer. How many of you think back over time and remember some game changers in your lives? How many of you made it through high school? Some game changers pray for you. Made it through college? Some game changers pray for you. How many of you making it through your jobs with a nasty boss? Some game changers praying for you. How many of you are rolling through these 
tough times under COVID-19 because some game changers are praying for you. I need you to say someone, I'm a game changer. I'm a game changer. I'm a game changer. In our scripture today, we, we find Jesus in the Passover season after he had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey and everyone had shouted Hosanna. And now Jesus went into the temple upset with the mess the religious leaders were allowing, cleared the temple and proceeded to empower the people. I need you to say something to someone beside you. Say, I need a game changer. In, 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 order, in, order, in order to empower the people to be game changers, I'm a three-point preacher, we have to do three things. Point number one, first we got to recognize that the game changer is in the temple. If you look at verse 12 through 13, Jesus went straight to the temple and threw out everyone who had set up shop buying and selling. The Bible says he kicked over the tables of loan sharks and the stalls of dove merchants. He quoted this text. My house was designated a house of prayer. You have made it a hangout for thieves. Jesus entered the great city and went to the temple, entering its outer courts, as did many in the crowd. People came to the temple in Jerusalem to sacrifice their offering where Jewish sacrifices were to be made. The temple was run by the high priest and his associates. God had originally instructed his people in his word to bring the sacrifices from their own flock of animals. However, the religious leadership has set up stores and marketplaces where you didn't have to bring your own animal. You could purchase one when you got there. Some people didn't bring their own animals. They purchased them when they got there. But here's the game they ran. After they did an inspection of the animal, they were told those animals didn't meet the qualifications, so they had to buy one when they got there. The high priest had authorized stores to be set up in the outer courts of the temple, and the outer courts was the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles was the only place that Gentile converts could worship. They couldn't go any further in the temple because they were not pure Jews. In other words, I need you to understand the merchants and the religious leaders were running games on the people in the temple. But Jesus recognized an opportunity to teach. He said all these things got to stop and he cleared out the temple because God's house was meant only to be a house of prayer for all people, not just the Jewish people, but all nations. But the merchants and the money changers, along with the Jewish religious leaders, we're using it to get over on the people. And I stopped by this evening just to say we got to recognize the opportunity to teach just like Jesus did. And we got to have the opportunity to let people know God's house is still a house of prayer. We've got to overturn some traditions and recognize the truth of the matter is none of that stuff matters at all to God. God's house is the house of prayer. It's a place... When I'm feeling low, I recognize the game changer is in the temple and I know I can enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise and feel the power of prayer. It's a place when I lose my job, I know I can enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise and feel the power of prayer. It's a place when COVID-19 has taken over my body and I don't know what to do. I can still virtually enter into his gates and enter into his thanksgiving and his courts of praise and feel the power of prayer and know that the game changer will meet you at your point of need. Say to someone, say to someone, I need a game changer. In, or, in order, in order, in order to empower the people to be game changers, we have to, point number two, allow the game changer to work. Allow the game changer to work. Go with me to verse 14. It says, now there was room for the blind and the crippled to get in. They came to Jesus and he healed them. After Jesus overturned the mess in the temple, it was significant that the blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple. What's the significance, Pastor? You see, usually the blind and the crippled, due to some of the Old Testament laws, were excluded from worship in the temple. But Jesus was greater than any man-made 
building. Jesus welcomed the blind and the crippled into the temple. Not only did he welcome them, he healed them. There were only, these are the only recorded healings inside the walls of the temple. Jesus broke tradition to indicate God is doing a new thing. And all people, no matter their color, all people, no matter their race, all people, no matter whether they're male or female, all people, no matter their sexual orientation, all people, no matter what language they spoke, all people, no matter their condition, are accepted into the presence of a holy God. And I want to talk to somebody today and ask you to allow the game changer to work and to stop keeping people out, stop keeping the left out, the misused and the lost away from church. I got to tell you, Big Mama, she did it her way. But maybe, just maybe, it's time for us to seek God and believe in the power of prayer and allow the game changer to work in these times. It's the game changer that's ready to go to work because the game changer is the one that heals the sick. It's the game changer that goes to work because the game changer is the one that mends the broken heart it. It's the game changer that goes to work because it's the game changer that opens blinded eyes. It's the game changer that's ready to go to work because it's the game changer that makes the mute talk again. It's the game changer that's ready to go to work because it's the game changer that would allow the lame to walk again. I need you to say to somebody, I need a game changer. I need a game changer. I need a game changer. Finally, finally, finally. We're going to come back there. Finally. In order to empower the people to be game changers, we got a point number three. Point number three. We got to bring back the shout of the children. We got to bring back the shout of the children. The Bible says, follow me in 15 and 16, when the religious leaders saw the outrageous things he was doing and heard all the children running and shouting through the temple, Hosanna to David's son. They were up in arms and took him to task. They said, did you hear what these children are saying? Jesus said, yes, I hear them. And haven't you read in God's word from the mouths of children and babes, I'll furnish a place of praise. It didn't take long for the news of Jesus' actions in the temple to reach the ears of the religious leaders. Y'all know that don't take long. The Sadducees and the scribes, uh, they didn't agree on much, but they always agreed right here that we got to do something about this Jesus that's upsetting our perceived authority in the temple. After Jesus healed the blind and the cripple, it wasn't the religious folks shouting and praising God for the healings it was the children, the Bible says, running and shouting through the temple. It was the children on fire for God. It was the children disrupting tradition because in those days, children were supposed to be quiet in the temple. And it was the children running and shouting, saying, Hosanna to David's son. And I came by to tell you, if we're going to empower the people to be game changers, we got to drop all our pettiness and begin to shout and praise like the children. We got to let the children see us praise again. We got to bring back the shout of the children. All the children shouted for was when they saw the folks get healed. The children begin to shout when the children see folks getting delivered off of drugs the children gonna shout when the children see folks getting delivered off of alcohol the children will shout when the children see mom and daddy's marriage get better the children will shout and when we shout and praise like the children we can restore the power Holy Ghost power in the church good evening capital district may the Lord God bless you real 
good. You were born to be game changers. The devil thought he stole your joy during this COVID-19 time. But game changers can't help but open their mouths, shout and give God praise. I'm almost done, but I want to thank the real game changer. I think you know him. I think you know him. I think you know him. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we're healed. Some said he's the great I am. Some said he's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Some said he's the rose of Sharon. Some said he's the lily of the valley. Some say he's the bright and the morning star. I call him Jesus, 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 a game changer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You keep changing the game. Say yeah. Yeah. Say yeah. He's a game changer. I would have fainted unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and the Lord will strengthen thine heart. Pray with me, if you will. Holy God, help me to preach. Comfort those who are being challenged by life and challenge those whom are comfortable. In Jesus' name, amen. My brothers and sisters, I would like to call your attention to Acts of the Apostle, chapter 3, the book of Acts, <clears throat> chapter 3, a very familiar story, beginning at verse number 1 reading from the New Living Translation. I invite you uh, to join with me there as we read the Word of God. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in each day with he was put, aside, put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate. So he could beg from the people going into the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently. And Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped and stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Verse number nine, all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar, they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were astonished. For the brief moments that the Holy Spirit will allow, I want to talk from the subject, disrupting the norm. Disrupting the norm. My brothers and sisters, the book of Acts is one of my favorite books in the Bible. I admire Acts because the name itself speaks volumes. It talks about action. 
and uh, centering our attention on this theme, advancing the kingdom of God, I'm here to tell you that it will take action. For the Bible says the kingdom of God is a matter of power and not that of talk. But in order to understand the totality of chapter 3, you must know and understand what took place in chapter 2 in the book of Acts. You know what happened in chapter 2. They all received the Holy Ghost. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is not just to make us feel good, but it is to give us power to be a witness. Uh, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is not just to make us shout, but it is to give us power to be about God's kingdom business. Everyone was walking and going to the temple for the prayer meeting and and the power, and I'm here to tell you that there is power in God's children coming together for prayer. The man was lame from birth and he was carried to the place, to the gate outside of the temple. The custom and the belief was that because he was lame, he could not go inside the temple. So he had to remain outside the temple and begin begging for money as the religious folks were going into the temple. Uh, the scripture says it was a beautiful place, but a messed up situation. It, it has been said, my brothers and sisters, that one would rather attend church with messed up people who love God than religious people who dislike messed up people. All of us have had something in our life that has made us lame. Fear will make you lame discouragement yeah it will make you lame negativity will make you lame self-righteousness will make you lame and here the scripture reveals to us that when the lame man saw Peter and John walking into the temple scripture says that he looked at Peter and John and ask for some money. Uh, my brothers and sisters, if we miss it, we don't want to miss it in this passage of scripture. It reveals something to us that could help us in advancing God's kingdom. Peter and John's eyes were fixed on the temple. Uh, the lame man's eyes was fixed on his problem. Both set of eyes needed to be fixed. Uh, let me say that one more time. Both set of eyes needed to be fixed because both set of eyes were fixed on the wrong thing. And the Spirit of God dropped this nugget in my mind that we got to fix our eyes. Instead of Peter and John fixing their eyes on the temple, the Spirit moved on them to fix their eyes on the man. And instead of the man fixing his eyes on his problem, the spirit commanded Peter and John to tell the man to fix your eyes on us. So here's the point that I'm wanting to make. Instead of us focusing on the temple, instead of us focusing on our problem, we got to learn how to focus on each other. So the text tells us that the man gave the disciples all of of his attention. Uh, whenever you have given your attention to someone, you have given that something control. Uh, what captures your attention uh, controls your life. Uh, because your attention is so connected to your thoughts and your thoughts are, are connected to your mind. And when they got the man's attention, they offered the brother something that was so much better than money. Why should I give you just money when you can have the one who creates money? Why should I just give you food when you can have the one who is the bread of life? So when we talk about 
advancing God's kingdom, we got to start giving people something greater, greater than us, greater than food, greater than money. We got to begin giving people the belief that they can walk again. We got to begin giving people the belief and the demonstration that God is real. We have to give people the capacity to believe that they can do all things through Jesus Christ. Peter and John didn't have money, but they had the name. Peter and John didn't have a walker or a wheelchair, but they had the name. And my brothers and sisters, can I tell you, as long as we take the name of Jesus with us, that's how, that's the power that God gives us in order to advance his kingdom. It's all in the name. For the scripture says, no other name is given unto earth, unto man, whereby we can be saved. When the man started walking, and the man started walking. He started leaping. And scripture says he started praising God. They took another brother to in, in for Christ. They won another soul over for the kingdom. And so understand this, my brothers and sisters. The gift that God has given to you is not for you to get the attention. But the gift that God has put in you is so that people can be won one over for the kingdom of God. Uh, but the man could not help but to praise God. Look at what the Lord had done for him. And so you say, Reverend, I hear the story. I understand the story. But what does the story have to do with disrupting the norm? Well, here we are in the midst of this pandemic and the church buildings have been in clothes and while we don't blame God for the pandemic I'm here to tell you that I believe God has a way of using situations that happens in our life to disrupt the norm here it was it was normal for the saints to go to the temple at three o'clock for prayer service it was normal for that beggar to be at the gate beautiful it was normal for for Peter and John to go to the temple but as they were on their way to the temple the beggar called out in other words God disrupted the norm and I'm here to tell you that that's what God is doing he's basically saying if the work don't happen inside the temple but the true work of the advancement of the kingdom of God takes place in the outside of the temple because folks in the temple won't let you forget your past because in the text the Bible says that when the man entered the temple the folks remembered that he was lame and that's what happened we got too much remembering of the past when God has delivered us from the past yes and so we're in the season and you say how do I advance the kingdom of God well God has set a door before us and saying to us that the true work of the kingdom don't happen inside the building but it happens out yellow and so the Bible says that the man started praising started leaping started jumping you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for you has done for me and sometimes the disruption of the Holy Ghost is for our good sometimes the Holy Ghost will disrupt the normalcy because we get used to we get used to this we get used to that and we forget that we got power power I said power 
power power to speak those things that are not as though they are when God decides to disrupt to shift your norm line up and watch God advance the kingdom of God All the platitudes and the protocol have been expressed. I want to take this moment to generally give thanks and honor to our presiding elder, presiding elder Johnny Calhoun and his soulmate, our first lady of the Capitol District, the Reverend Patricia Calhoun. We're grateful for this marvelous team. This theme has been during the Capitol District about the kingdom. And Jesus talks about the kingdom on a number of occasions. And I want to share uh, one particular parable that Jesus, or story rather, that Jesus talks about, about the kingdom. And is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, beginning at verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and unto one he gave five talents to another two to another one to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey and then he had then he that had received rather the five talents went and traded the same and made them other five talents and likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. My assignment is to talk about kingdom legacy. And if you're going to establish a kingdom legacy, I want to suggest that you cannot bury your gift. And so I want to talk about don't bury your gift. Don't bury your gift. When you talk about being gifted, then you have to understand that the gift means nothing if there is no need. So then when God puts a gift in a person, God then turns around and creates a need. And whenever your need satisfies or your gift satisfies the need, you have just discovered, you have just found out what your calling is because God does not expect you to fulfill a need that you have not been called to fulfill. So the key to a fulfilling, satisfying, prosperous, legacy-leaving life is to find out what need you are, have been required or gifted to fulfill in this life. In our parable, the master summons the servant, which means that the servant did not belong to themselves. And that means that you and I do not belong to ourselves. And because we do not belong to ourselves, you and I can't live any way that we choose. If I belong to God, I must give God an explanation on how I use me. I do not answer to me for me. But I answer to God for me because I don't belong to me. I belong to God. For the parable says to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, to another one according to their unique ability. Which means now that God has surveyed the situation and has checked out all that you are and God has decided he checked out your intellectual cognitive ability checked out your energy level God has checked out all that you are and God decided to give one one talent somebody else two talents and someone else five God did not do this arbitrarily I mean God did not do this beside by some roll of dice no God looked at your ability to handle what God had given you. God did not do this by happenstance. That's why when you look at somebody else beside you who has five or two gifts, you shouldn't look at them with contempt, jealousy, 
envy or complaint because simply is, the simple thing is, they did not determine the level of giftedness that they have. It was God, and it was God all by God's self. Now, the gift of God in you will bring out two groups in your life. It'll bring out haters and congratulators. But I've lived long enough. I lived a few days to know that you always have more haters then congratulators and so your gift is vital because when your gift is alive you don't always receive financial remunceration because when your gift fits a need it is something that you would do even if you never got paid for it because your gift drives you it drives you from the depths of your soul and you are comfortable with it and you just do it naturally that means if I woke you up at three in the morning you could get up with matter in your eyes sleep in your eyes and operate immediately in your gift you don't have to be pumped up you don't have to be psyched up all you have to do is open up and it will flow right out of you because God is using your gift to meet somebody's need but let's finally look at the unfaithful servant who buried his gift first of all he had no thrills will you touch yourself and say I'm glad to be who God has has made me to be. Are you glad to know that God has his hands on you? Are you glad to know that you've been called by God? While others were out working, the unfaithful servant was digging a hole. While the others were out doubling what they had, the unfaithful servant was burying his because he had the wrong attitude towards the one who gave him the gift in the first place. If you love the one who gave you the gift in the first place, you'll work your gift for him. If you love the one who has anointed you, you'll work your gift for him. If you love the one who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light, you'll work it for him. Don't you bury your gift. See, the enemy wants you to bury your gift. The attitudes of people who get an attitude about how God blesses you, and they want you to bury your gift. Love relationships will dig a hole for your give. You got to say to yourself later for romance. I've got a job to do and I don't have time to be chasing some man or some woman. I've got to use the gift that God has given me because I've got a legacy to live. For I heard the Lord say, what shall I render unto God for all of his benefits towards me? I work it for the Lord. Will you touch yourself again and say work it for him. Work it until everybody around you gets the blessing that they need work it until it becomes a new house, a new car a new career, a new vision a new dream, work it until your ministry blows up, work it and don't let me tell, let nobody tell you that you don't have it, I know the anointing is on you, I know it's in the atmosphere, I know what you got, look at how far God has brought you and what you have survived along the way it's time for you to get up and establish your kingdom legacy and work your gift until the devil gets mad. Work your gift until the devil goes crazy. Work your gift until heaven starts shouting. Work your gift for it's time for you to work your gift. Use it until God gets the glory. Somebody touch yourself and said, I've got a kingdom legacy to leave because God is using me to work my gift. Somebody shout glory. Somebody right where you are shout hallelujah OM to the G can you give God a hand clap of praise for those words that we have heard from those four dynamic preachers praise God hallelujah hallelujah and now we just want to extend an invitation to accept Jesus Christ in your life if you have never done that we extend to you the invitation to accept him into your heart all you have to do is to pray the prayer of salvation Lord come into my life I want to be different I want to change God I want you as Lord and Savior of my life if that's you tonight there will be more information to follow on how you can give your life to Christ if that is you the Lord is waiting for you he is waiting with open arms so tonight if that is you to receive Jesus Christ, more information will follow. Amen.
Praise the Lord, everybody. It is offering time. Amen. It's offering time. It's time for us to give on tonight, and we just are grateful for the opportunity to be able to give. We're grateful. We're so grateful for our presiding elder as we prepared and put things together for the Capital District Conference. Uh, if you notice, we have, we're only taking up one offering throughout the entire conference, and so we are coming today, amen, asking for all of you who can, and we are praying that you will try, for all of you who can, amen, the offering for today is $100. We're asking for those who um, are writing checks that you write your check out to the Washington Conference uh, Capital District, the Washington Conference Capital District, amen. And so we would just ask that you write your checks out to the Washington Conference Capital District. We're asking that checks can be mailed to the Washington Conference Capital District, P.O. Box 118 in Glen Burnie, Maryland, 21060. You can also use Cash App, amen, and it's dollar sign capital C, capital A, capital P, capital D, capital I, capital S, capital T. So it's dollar sign cap district, cap dicks. So if you want to use Cash App, if you're using Givelify, we would ask that you use Givelify through Washington Conference Capital District AME Church. And so we have given you three options to give on today. We want to thank you in advance, amen, for giving on tonight. We give God praise and we understand that there is a sacrifice in giving. And we are praying that God will pour back into you all that you have given on today. Thank you so much. God bless you for your giving. Good evening and praise the Lord, saints. I'll be bringing you the announcements. Please join us for the Washington Annual Conference Christmas with the Bishop on Wednesday, December the 9th at 8 p.m. The Capital District Yaya Movie Night will be held Friday, December 11th. The Capital District Yaya Friday Night and After Dark will be Friday, January 22nd and Friday, January 29th. The Second Episcopal District Midwinter Meeting will be held Thursday and Friday, February 11th and 12th. And get ready for the District Christian Education Conference on Saturday, March 6th. The 71st session of the Washington Annual Conference will be held Thursday through Friday, April 15th through the 16th. And the Second Episcopal District Planning Meeting will be held Friday and Saturday, May 14th through the 15th. Get ready. We look forward to seeing you. God bless you and stay safe. Praise the Lord, everybody. Haven't we had it a tremendous time in the Lord? I don't know about you, but I've been blessed and I thank God for all that our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. I thank God that we were able to come together and bless his holy name. Oh, I tell you, there's so many people that I need to thank for doing a marvelous job in pulling this all together. There was a tremendous planning committee that thought it not robbery to meet with great conviction and great effort to make all of this take place. Of course, I want to thank God for the co-hosts, the Reverend Dr. Gerald Folsom of Hemingway Memorial and the Reverend Dr. Derek Brown of New Hope. And we thank God for our conference coordinator, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Kearney, and the support that was given by his tremendous church, Turner Memorial. Oh, we thank God for all of the participants, all the persons who were part of the various activities. These preachers, oh my God, didn't they preach tonight? We thank God for the preachers, for all of the teachers who taught on the theme. We thank God for the Bryant family that led us in the uh, panel discussion, conducting effective ministry in a virtual world, in a virtual church. We thank God for all of the workshop participants and for our moderators. We thank the Lord for everyone who joined us, be it virtual. 
and thank you so much wherever you hailed from, whether or not you were here locally in Maryland or D.C. or Virginia, somewhere throughout the nation, oh my God, maybe somewhere even in the world. Thank you for coming by and blessing us. Our aim was simply this. It was to glorify the Lord beyond all measure, to please him through every aspect of this conference, and we pray that we did. As we close, I want to thank Bishop James LaVert Davis again for the opportunity to be the presiding elder of the greatest presiding elder district in the AME Church. I want to thank God for the pastors, for your hard work, for your dedication and your diligence. And I just want to thank all of the members of the Capital District. May the Lord continue to smile upon you as our benediction is now coming forth. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace today, tomorrow, and forever. And the people of God said amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>